Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for braving the roads and the weather and being here again today. I'm very pleased. And we're starting with German punctuality today, okay? So, my name is Gerda. I know there are some people who were not here last week, so you have to hear the spiel again, okay? So I'm the director of Global Programs. I get to organize this lovely, I think lovely, uh, honor symposium lecture series. So I'm very pleased that this is actually in the 26th year. It's only my second year organizing it, so um, I feel very honored to do that. And we, as you know, it's a presidential lecture series, and we bring in speakers, experts that we don't necessarily have in the Valley and we bring them in for, from the state, everywhere in the states, or some international speakers as well. So, I just want to mention that we cannot import or bring these folks here without the generous support from our community, and this particular series is funded by the Theodore Chase Endowment Fund, uh, given by Alison Young. Some of you might know her from here in the community. We also, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't think Alison is here today because she's somewhere gallivanting in the world on some fantastic trip. Um, then we also have uh, received another grant this year, yay, from the Humanities Montana. And we also have the support of the American Association of uh, University Women and, of course, FVCC alumni and friends. So in, on behalf of our entire college community, I thank everybody for that support. Um, as you know, and all of you have either gotten a brochure last time or you have one in your hands right now if you're newcomers that outlines the entire series. This is our second speaker today and we have three more to come the subsequent Thursday, same time, same place. And the subject is Europe at the crossroads, social and political unity, um, threats to social and political unity and why these matter to us here in the U.S. So um, today we're going to examine... Um, the second, 28th, we're going to examine the changes underway in Europe, specifically in Turkey, which plays a very important uh, geopolitical role in southeastern Europe and overall. So, our speaker tonight will join us, it has joined us from the University of Missouri in Columbia, where she holds a professorship in the Department of German and Russian Studies, and is also the program director of the Center for the Digital Globe. Dr. Fisher is um, teaching and conducting research um, around issues of globalization with an emphasis on the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. Her main fields of research and teaching are global and transnational studies, and she spent quite a bit of time in Turkey as well, you know, where I haven't spent time, where she explored the nation's current geopolitical role. So you will notice a slight accent, but don't be fooled because she's an Oregon duck, like me as well, okay? <laughs> So, a bit of housekeeping. Um, as usual, we are going to, I'm, at some point in the lecture, I'm going to get up, walk around, and collect your question cards. And then Dr. Fisher will try to address as many as she possibly can, but she also graciously agreed that she's going to hang out after the talk when she runs out of voice. And she, you can approach the podium and she'll chat a little bit more with you so she don't feel like your qu questions don't get answered. Um, so, um, now, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Fisher. Well, thank you very much. Is it working? No. Nope. I pushed it, I thought. Uh, testing. Testing? <laughs> How about now? Did I do something? Oh, there, there it go. is. There yeah, go. okay, I did do something. Yeah, something good. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be in Montana. I think it, it's the first time actually I'm here in winter. I usually have traveled through the state in summer. I think they can hear you so well. Can we ask the ball? Again? Oh. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Ooh. That's better. Yeah. Um, Ooh, that sounds, I have to get used to that. Does it, is it okay? Yeah. It sounds really loud. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, and I need this. Um, is that on? 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, actually, this is a picture I took um, in Turkey. I don't know who these people are. I tried to crop them out, and then I thought, well, what the heck? We are on a trip. So envision that we are on this little trip in through the Bosporus. This is in Istanbul. Uh, I've spent a considerable, a considerable amount of time in Turkey, have uh, friends there. And my goal today is to look at Turkey, look at the geopolitical role, the neighbor, the relationships with the neighbors, with uh, world powers, with the United States. Also, always I'm always thinking, well, why are you here? Why Turkey? What's of interest? So uh, I try to make that connection. And, and I also have a couple of slides in there from, that I took from the people there. I think it's also very important to look at what the people are like, what they live, uh, what, what the culture is like. I've got just a really quick overview here, and it might be too far for you, for some of you to see that. I wanted to point out, let's see if that works. Ethnic diversity, we'll be talking a little about that because that might, if you can read it, it says no official census. Uh, that says something about Turkey. Why is there no census? Why don't we know how many Kurds live in Turkey? Uh, language, where is it? The official language is Turkish. Is there no other language? So there's uh, already points at some problems with the Republic of Turkey. Since 1923, not even 100 years old, so it's a fairly new country. Um, yeah, let's move on. So I wanted to talk a, a little bit about my experience there when I arrived there, a little bit about the Turkish culture. So imagine yourself when you go to Turkey, you have all these, I don't know what you have in your head, maybe, you know, politics, you heard about the Kurds being oppressed, and then of course Syria war, right now the Turkey is involved. But really when you are there, you're going to be confronted with an incredibly hospital, hospitable environment. Everywhere you get to have chai, tea, which is wonderful, uh, for free or you, you pay for it. Uh, baklava, whoops. No, what am I doing here? I'm sorry. I gotta get used to this thing, yeah. This here is baklava you're, you're familiar with, but that you probably also associate with Greece, uh, with Greek food. That also is an issue that comes up when we talk about Turkey. Let me push the right <laughs> button here. Okay, the evil eye, that might be uh, something you've heard about. Actually, almost every culture has uh, a theory around the evil eye. This is very prominent in the Middle East, the blue, the eye with blue, but you find it in India, you find it here in this country too. You might have heard Jewish culture that you don't praise a child too much because that might bring bad spirits to the child, so you spit on it afterwards. You might have heard of that. In some cultures they do that. Seems odd, but you know, humans are, we are a you know, little, I actually have a little evil eye uh, with me. Who knows? <laughs> uh, it might be helpful. But that happened to be a tree full of these evil eyes when I saw them. Uh, the Sufi dancers, you associate that with Turkey. It was basically forbidden uh, during the time of, uh, uh, in the beginning of the Turkish Republic, up until really 2000. Uh, the Sufis are, but they're still a very strong group of, of uh, mystics, and the, uh, uh, they go back to Rumi as a Persian uh, mystic and poet. And now, actually, I have that line up there, Rumi, follow us, fight to keep Turks from cashing in on Mystic's legacy, was an article, because when you go to Turkey as a tourist, you can find many cities, you can find places where you can see the Rumis dance, pray. So the issue comes up, is this for making money, or uh, are there still Sufis who actually do this as a, uh, their spiritual practice? And then the Hagia Sophia, when you think of Istanbul, that comes up. And I have some information up there if you can read that. So the Hagia Sophia used to be a Greek Orthodox Christian cathedral for, from 537 to 1453 for a very long time, the Byzantium uh, 
uh, Byzantine uh, Empire, and then an Ottoman mosque under the Ottoman Empire. You see the numbers here, 1453 to 1923, uh, five, six hundred years, and then a museum since 1923 under Ataturk, and recently there have been calls to revert it back to a mosque. So these issues also tell you something about what's going on in Turkey. Turkey is a country that is in the last definitely 10 years uh, has changed a lot. It's on the verge of uh, maybe turning into an autocratic um, system. Some people say that actually the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago was an article they called uh, Turkey is a tyranny now, their system, you know, a tyranny. I think that goes a little too far. I don't quite agree with that. Hopefully it won't go that far. Um, yeah, so here I also, this is too small and I, I don't go through all this, but if you can read that, I, I'm, what I want to do with you is I want to look at the neighbor states. What is the relationship like with the neighbors? Look at that bridge metaphor. I'll talk about that in a moment. History, this is just a very quick uh, overview. The Byzantine Empire until 1453. The Ottoman Empire started earlier, 2099, but 1453 is a very crucial date. That's when Hagia Sophia, that's when uh, Constantinople, you might have heard that name, was um, uh, taken over by the Ottomans, the Osmanis, and the Ottoman Empire uh, spread and then beyond Istanbul, they spread beyond Istanbul, uh, Istanbul and named the city Istanbul. Uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, very important name because he is seen as the founder of the present Republic of Turkey. Um, his political system is referred to as Kemalist secularism, so when you hear Kemalism, it comes from his name. Mustafa Kemal. Kemal was his, well not really his last name. Turks did not have last names. They chose last name like Ataturk through him. He made that a requirement when the Turkish Republic was founded. And then uh, military coups was after 1923 up until really 1997, the last military coup. That has been a problem in retrospect that people don't trust the party, the CHP, the Democratic Party that always was supported by the military, very staunch secularism, but because of the military coups, people were very reluctant to vote for that. That's one theory why people have been voting for the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, which has been in power since 2002, which is quite some time. And I'll talk more about that. Um, yeah, let me move to this slide. You don't you know, have to read it. It's just I've been working on what to convey to you because one, one of my arguments with Turkey is that on the one hand we hear it's turning from a, from a circ, uh, secular country to an authoritarian country. There is definitely a move towards an authoritarian uh, uh, system and an Islamized one and back to a Muslim country. Now you have to know even so Turkey is the only Muslim secular country, democracy, it's always been a Muslim country. People, many people still followed their religion but it was uh, private, it was definitely you know separated from the government. So the Kemalist secularism, a very strict type of uh, ideology, Kemalism, all isms and ideology, that started in 1923 through Ataturk, uh, has really changed, especially through the AKP in 2002, and has, in the beginning, it was a liberal democratic Islamic model that one can, you know, there are theorists that say in the beginning people thought the AKP is moderate, okay, they have an Islamic uh, slant to it, but that will stay in the private uh, area. And in the beginning, uh, Erdogan, who was the uh, prime minister at that time, for, and now he is the, the president, 
uh, was also very moderate, was interested in EU accession, gave uh, the Kurds who have been uh, oppressed um, more legal rights, the right to use their language, which they weren't allowed to up until about in the early 2000s, and then slowly started to move away from that approach again. Uh, and, and what we now have is a sort of a populist authoritarian system, really. Um, I have a slide later if I get to that. But when you, you know, we have a president who loves tweets. We know that now. We had to get used to that. That was new. Social media, that's what politicians use now. So the way um, Donald Trump uses tweets, what Erdogan does, he uses TV, it's always televised, he gives speeches, about two a day. He's supposed to be an incredible orator, very uh, astute and at times, but most of the time just speaks from his heart, from his stomach, Germans would say from his <laughs> stomach, uh, which means he's rude. He, you know, he can be very rude, he can be, he's attacking Donald Trump, he's attacking the US, he's attacking Iran, he's attacking anybody. And people, his followers like that. And you hear with populists, you often hear followers say, he speaks like we do, he's one of us. And that can be, yeah, on, in the one hand, yeah, I want somebody who represents me to be one of us. But if that one of us is doing what our children in school are taught not to do, being bullies and rude, then we have a little bit of a problem. And that seems to be on the rise around the world. When you look at it, and I mentioned that in the bottom, um, Brazil now has a president who told a woman that um, she, he doesn't think she's fit to be raped. And I go, what? You know, when I read that, and I don't have the exact quote, I, you know, he's been racist, he's been misogynist, and that I find a troubling um, development in the world right now. And hopefully, you know, Turkey is not moving any further to the right, any further off dividing the country, because it's really quite a divided country. I show you later on a slide with the referendum, uh, I think it's 48 to 51 percent vote. So if somebody says, I'm speaking for the people, hmm, for half of them, a little over half of them. And that means you've got to, and that's a true democracy, you've got to also speak for the other half or the other that's a slight minority and other minorities. And that leads me to say, you know, what is a democracy? And that's something I want, you know, to us to think about. There is, re there is no clear um, explanation of what a democracy is, other than free elections, freedom of speech. But there are many other factors that make a democracy. And then a, a populist uh, a state, at times with a free election, what if the election is fraud? How do you prove that? One part of the population says it's not fraud, the other one says it's fraud. Uh, that's a challenge, especially in times of social media, in times when we get bombarded with so much news and so many different type of news. How do we know what's true and what's not true? And I don't want to use that uh, F word, not the, the fake, you know, the fake news. I think that's a little bit overused these days. Um, and I got that from an article at the end, you know, it says relies on police state techniques and can be identified by the smell of tear gas. And I had a chuckle when I saw that because unfortunately, yeah, that does seem to be the case in many countries when, and also in our country here, when there's a demonstration, um, the state and it, you know, the governor, the mayor, what do I do? I've got to have order, send the police, and the police is sometimes over, they're not really prepared, and throw tear gas on, on peaceful demonstrators. And that's happened a lot in Turkey. Uh, strategic bridge between East and West, I took that snapshot from, um, I think it's Google Maps, so you can see, let's see, I mean, here's Turkey, I assume, um, I don't know, I shouldn't assume anything, but most likely you're interested in the topic, you kind of know where Turkey is. Um, the 
idea about the strategic bridge that's been used in connection with Turkey for a long, long time. Already the Ottomans actually liked to call themselves towards the end when the Ottoman Empire lost more and more territory. They still, you know, they wanted to see themselves to other nations. We are here to help you bridge. Let's see uh, this Western. Uh, world and then here the especially the Middle East but partly also because the Ottoman Empire went all the way to through North Africa we are there to bridge any kind of um, disagreements that you know any kind of treaty that we need to um, work on just a quick uh, look at Europe Cold War the bridge idea of course was used in the Cold War that was very important um, because now sometimes you hear, what do we need Turkey? Okay, Cold War, I can see, because, whoops, where is it? Right here. Uh, Turkey was the most eastern uh, flank of the, the NATO, and it's a NATO partner since 1952, actually quite early. Uh, and then, as you remember, many of you, Cold War, 1989, uh, when it, more or less ended, but the NATO, the answer to NATO was the Warsaw Pact. So for um, you know, 40 years, we lived in a world where there were two superpowers who tried to get as many allies as possible on their side, which I think my next slide, yeah, you can see here in the world, the blue, the NATO is the dark, but the blue are other allies of the United States, looking at the United States as, as the NATO superpower and the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union superpower up here had the red states on their side. Um, and as you can see here, Turkey is kind of in between, it's really far into the Warsaw Pact countries. This is still an issue or is an issue again. You actually come across now articles that talk about a second Cold War, a new Cold War, Cold War II. Uh, you can find that if you Google that because people are looking at what's going on right now. For example, when you look at Syria, is that a proxy war? We've got on the one side, um, the Russians supporting the Syrian government with the Iranians. On the other side, we have the United States with, the Saudi, with Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Turkey is floundering. Turkey has been fairly strongly as a NATO partner on the United States side against Assad. But then Turkey has, it has a difficult role. It does want to see itself as a bridge. That's Erdogan's. That was his his slogan when he came to power in 2002, and that created some problems. Also, the Turkey, the Republic of Turkey, is a very shrunken part of the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire saw itself as an empire that represented Turkic Turkic tribes. I'm trying to pronounce that right. Yeah. Turkic tribes. So the Turkic tribes, that is an ethnic group that is widespread. And now I don't remember which slide, but I have a slide on there that's kind of surprising when you see that. So there have been claims on and off. Uh, the AKP brings up that they are the protectors and the true representatives of Turkic tribes. And that, of course, raises eyebrows in the sovereign nations that have Turkic people. And that's Armenia, that's Azerbaijan, that uh, even Russia, um, Iran has a Turk, and Iraq, uh, definitely. So you've got, you can see right away, that can create a conflict. 2004, the bridge as a metaphor was very important for uh, George W. Bush at that time. By the way, when Bush invaded Iraq, Turkey did not go along with it because they said, these are our brothers in Iraq. Uh, that's, that was kind of a beginning of Erdogan starting to say, we are strong, we don't need the EU, because EU was very, is a problem, didn't want them, and, and the US uh, not either. And of course he's heard a lot of criticism all around the world of this unilateral decision to march into Iraq. So that probably bolstered his confidence that he could be critical. Uh, often the bridge as a metaphor, you can also come across it called the Turkish model. The Turkish model is uh, 
democracy, by a Muslim democracy, a democracy that is secular, but uh, a Muslim country. It's the only one. Um, what's interesting of this picture to pictures are important. There were about 30 people deciding where to take this picture, where he should give his speech, where he talked about Turkey being a bridge and a partner with the US. Um, you see here, uh, this is, where is it? here, this here is the Bosporus Bridge, which has been renamed in 2016. But that's Bosporus Bridge is connecting the European part of Turkey, which is very small, to the larger part, to the um, Asia Minor, to the Asian part. So the Bosporus Bridge, as a metaphor in that picture, then you've got, it's a Muslim country, you've got the the mosque, the Ortakai Mosque. And then, interestingly, it's on the grounds of the Galatasaray uh, University, which is a private university where the language of instruction is French. So it's a conglomerate of ideas of why to present kind of a cosmopolitan picture, but also the message, Turkey is our friend, we need Turkey, and Turkey helps to keep peace in, in the world. Here is, a, I took that picture, so it's not very perfect. This is up here, that's actually a, not a finger, but an umbrella. I tried, yeah, I just left it in there. So my pictures are not uh, professional, but in a way, the colors are nice. Uh, so you've got the Bosporo Bridge. This is Asia over here. We are on the European side, and this is this beautiful, fairly small uh, mosque from the 19th century, uh, Ortakai Koi. Uh, this bridge is called now 15th of July Matters Bridge because of the coup that happened in 2016. I'll talk about that. Some of you might remember reading about it. There was a coup which was a big surprise and a big shock to the world, to Turks, because they were they remembered coups from the military time, but all of a sudden it was under Ataturk. Uh, but I'll get to that. So just a little background in case you're not so sure about what you remember. You've heard about the Ottoman Empire, but what is this all about? I don't know. <laughs> the Young Turks and Other Turks Republic. Um, I thought this is interesting to see. That gives you an idea of the Ottoman Empire's power in the from what is it, 1683 was probably that was the high time of the Ottoman Empire, just like any empire, it started small, it grew, and then it started to wane and lose power again. So by 1920, you've got this little part, actually by 1920, the Sultan had left, he was asked to leave, and his brother was just a representative uh, Sultan, and then the Sultanate, the Caliph, Caliphate was uh, um, dissolved by, by the uh, Turks. The Young Turks was, um, in, and all this didn't happen overnight, 1923 Ataturk. It's actually a very interesting history. You can find that anywhere online. You might want to read up a little on that. I'm not going too much into depth here. But uh, uh, Ataturk was, uh, let me see what is, yeah, here he is, was a soldier and he kind of moved up in the ranks and then he joined, he, he comes from Saloniki, which is now Thessaloniki, which is in, uh, in Greece, at that time was part of the uh, Turkish Empire, and he grew up in a very multi-ethnic, cosmopolitan atmosphere. He read a lot of Voltaire, Tolstoy, French Revolution, so very early on his sentiments were against um, the, you know, the, the uh, Ottomans and the Sultan power over the people. He wanted a more cosmopolitan, a more, uh, well, he wanted freedom for the people. He wanted a republic that started very early and he gathered people around him and were, he was with the Young Turks, that's a group of fairly you know, younger Turks who took over, who forced the Sultan to abdicate and forced in the 19, there was about 1909, 10, uh, a new style of government, but they were hesitant. They still thought uh, a, a Sultanate needs to exist. An interesting anecdote I read um, 
a traveler from Istanbul went way out in Anatolia, that's way east in the rural areas, and villages were asking, what's going on in Istanbul? What's, because they've heard some news. And he told them, well, the Sultan isn't there anymore. He went to, I think, Romania, I forget where they, or Bulgaria, where, where he, he abdicated. And they couldn't believe it. I said, what? What? How can that be? How can, you know, so, so now what? Who is the new sultan? Uh, sultan, I think you say sultan, sultan, yeah. And he, so uh, the traveler told uh, the, the visitor, said, well, there is none. We will not have a, sul a sultan anymore. And the village people, the traveler's accounts as they looked at him and they just, that's impossible. They, we, how can a state exist without a sultan? And I thought they kind of caught my attention because it shows how, how deeply embedded certain ideas, ideologies are in our minds, in each individual mind, depending on where we grow up, what we've heard, and, and then it depends on how willing are we to maybe throw this all over and look at a new system. It's not easy. For most people, it's almost impossible because it means new grounds, it means insecurity, it means looking at, and that's what Ataturk, you know, pushed his people into a totally different way of life. Um, let me see, I've, yeah, here I wanted to show, oh, this is actually a colleague did that, she took She's right here, so I only took the photos without her. She's a journalist. We traveled through Turkey, and she did a lot of selfies with Atatürk. Atatürk is everywhere, as a statue, as a picture, in every office, in every school, in every public uh, building, and a lot of people in private have Atatürk's picture. Erdogan, the second the most powerful man, he's called now, next to Atatürk, since Atatürk's time, uh, has been chiseling away at this legacy. And I remember three years ago when I was there, there have been stories about Atatürk was an alcoholic. He was. He died of liver cirrhosis, uh, actually in 38 or so, so fairly young even. Uh, and, and alcohol and Muslims, that doesn't go together. So Erdogan is a staunch um, uh, opponent to alcohol. So bringing out, uh, uh, criticizing Atatürk, bringing out these stories of him woman, womanizing and being an alcoholic, it has also the aim of kind of cutting down Atatürk and bringing themselves up, which is yeah, this is what one does when you want to gain power and and uh, secure your power position, which can be positive. It's I'm not you know I don't even want to judge that. That's just the way it's done. Um, so, uh, but but one interesting uh, last week I think I saw that just now, uh, uh, right? I don't even remember his name, but somebody wrote an autobiography, and the book is called M. Kemal, M. Mustafa Kemal. It's a big hit. There are millions of copies I read. Well, let's say thousands. Did I read millions? Seems a little high. Thousands, thousands of copies. Any writer would love thousands of copies being sold. Uh, and I saw pictures of him signing the copies. So that, of course, is a warning sign to the powers, to the AKP party. Let's just stay away from criticizing him too much. He's still, Ataturk is still a hero in the Republic of Turkey. And here you see why. When the Ottoman Empire uh, um, dissolved, one of the reasons was the last sultan sided with Germany in World War I. And that was a mistake. Germany lost, the Allies moved in, and here you can see uh, allies, Britain, France, uh, Russia, taking uh, sections of Turkey and discussing, kind of similar to what happened to Germany after World War II, what do we do with uh, these? Let's, everybody keeps a section for themselves, sounds very like col uh, you know, colony, um, and give the Turks this little part here, way in the east, let them have that and create a small Turkish whatever they want to do with it. I'm simplifying here, I'm sounding a little. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, but that's probably how, you know, I, that's what I envision when all the Berlin conference, they look at the map, well, I want this part. No, you get, you get this one if you give me this part. That's how they actually, the men divided uh, Africa. That's the Berlin conference. And in this case, that's where, you know, who decided on the borders 
um, and the Treaty of uh, Sevres decided on this map. This is uh, what Turkey should look like basically here. This part should be Turkey because that's the heartland of the Turkish. That's where the Ottomans uh, came from. When Ataturk and his uh, followers heard that, they said no. This is not what we want, this is not what the Turkish people want. We want our own state and they fought. For a few years there were the independence wars and he won and I'm simplifying that. Those were a lot of people died. But then the Treaty of Lausanne was uh, uh, in 1923. Uh, they met again with the Allies and the Allies decided to. And also Allies is the same with Germany. What are you going to do with this? part if that's part of Britain. So I'm, you know, Britain is responsible for it. That happened a little bit with what happened with Germany with, uh, when the Allies decided let's have them as a, you know, a self-governed country with a constitution that we approve Western powers and then the Russian Soviet Union at that time for uh, Germany decided to break away and have their own constitution. They couldn't come to an agreement naturally because ideologically they were so uh, separate. So here we've got the Treaty of Lausanne and here you see present-day Turkey, 1923, the borders were. There was still a, uh, an issue a little bit here towards Bulgaria and Greece, but that was eventually settled. Um, I'm not going into the part, but you might have heard of also the big movement of Greek Turks and Turkish Greek that was that sounds when you read it like, oh, okay, then a few hundred thousand people packed their bags and there was an agreement between Greece and Turkey to move people. The, so the Greeks who lived in Turkey with a Greek uh, ethnic background had to go back to Greece and the Turks, and there was a smaller portion in Turkey, in Greece had to go to Turkey. Of course, what it meant was for the individuals um, a huge, traumatic experience, leaving home, only taking what you can carry. And then there were animosities, there was fighting. Uh, Izmir is about here, and I don't see, I think it says Izmir, yeah, that's, that's the new name that used to be Smyrna until 1920s. And Smyrna burning, you might have heard that. Uh, Smyrna was in flames and people died trying to flee Smyrna. That's now present day is, um, Izmir. Uh, Ataturk and Erdogan, so these are the two people I've been talking about. And of course the question is, and I'm just leaving a question mark because I, don't, I can't judge that uh, if, if Erdogan is turning into an authoritarian ruler. Ataturk definitely was because the only way for him and his you know, people who supported him to make his country, this new republic, look towards the West, westernize, modernize, by changing the script from Arab script to Latin script. Imagine that's done more or less. Within three months, he changed the language. Ottoman Turkish was, uh, had to be changed to Turkish, which meant taking all Arabic and Farsi. Ottoman Turkish was a combination between Turkish, Farsi, and Arabian. Uh, those uh, words had to be taken out. The dress code had to change. Men were not allowed to wear the face, and women were not or should not wear uh, head scarves, which I have pictures later in the heartland of Anatolia, uh, that never fully happened. People were still going to their mosque, still uh, keeping to their old traditions, which Ataturk looked down upon. He said, this is old, this is uh, looking backwards, we need to look to the front. And then he chose a government styled after Western powers. He chose the Swiss code of law, uh, instead of Sharia law, um, and so forth. So. And then we have now Erdogan who came to power and you can see up here 1994 to 1980 he was mayor of Istanbul. He, his training is as an imam, his tra training is as a religious uh, speaker and that's why he's giving such good speeches, that's actually he was trained to do that. He gave a speech where he, and you can see that, you can find that online, it's a poem that he used where he incited 
and actually the military claimed that, and I think it's true when you read that poem, uh, that the minarets are like bayonets that you have to fight. He incited Muslims, you need to fight for your belief, to fight against the secular uh, uh, um, um, no, um, government. And that they uh, took him, I mean, he lost his job as mayor and he actually had to go to prison uh, near Istanbul on the, on the European side. When, they, when he was driven to prison, there were people lining the streets cheering for him. He became a hero. Actually, that act that the military threw him in prison at that time probably gave him a lot of great PR. Because then later, uh, and I'm just jumping over, you know, I'm not going through all that history, but he fo uh, founded uh, the AKP. At that time in 2001, he was not allowed to be the prime minister yet. So his close ally friend, uh, Gül, Abdullah Gül, became prime minister until the time was up for five years. He wasn't allowed to run for political office. So even so, so he founded it, but not on paper yet, not officially until those five years were over. He was prime minister until until 2014, president till 17, and actually we just uh, last year, two years ago, was a referendum asking the people to change Turkey's uh, parliamentary system to a presidential system. And his opposition is, is very worried because it gives him a lot of power, consolidated power. His uh, followers say that's needed, and he, of course, you know, he says that's needed for security purposes. So uh, his background is definitely Islamist political background. Western powers were or originally thinking they're very moderate. He called, he always said we are uh, conservative Democrats, never said we are Islamists, but that uh, rhetoric has changed the last few years. Um, just a quick here, the People's Alliance is, is, is this, this group here. So they are the ruling party. Together they didn't get enough uh, votes to be, to have, uh, uh, to, to uh, dominate the parliament, the Grand Assembly. So they um, have a cooperation with the Nationalist Movement Party, very right-leaning. Uh, a party with the Grey Wolves is the youth uh, sector which has been accused of being uh, fascist. Uh, and then you've got the CHP is the other large party that has been in power for many years but they're associated with the uh, military. So when I ask my friends when I'm in Turkey and most of my friends are not Erdogan fans, uh, they say, you know, I'm saying, well, there's so many people so critical of Erdogan, but why is he winning, even so a small margin? And they say one of the big problems is there is no good opposition. They're splintered, lots of small parties. Uh, I put the PKK here, but that is actually an outlawed party that's uh, considered a terrorist organization by Turkey and also by the United States, but not all over the world. Some uh, areas uh, in the world say no, that you know, they do not see them. They see the uh, PKK as a party that stands up for the Kurdish people and the oppression because one of the issues when Erdogan took over, and I hadn't mentioned that yet, the Republic of Turkey, you know, how do you form a nation? How do you get people to stand behind what changes you want to have, uh, to, to push through? Is by saying a Turk is a Turk is a Turk. There is no one else. So if you're a Kurd, even so about 18 to 20 percent of Turks are Kurds, you don't exist. Okay, at home you can use your language, but not in school, not in public, and you shouldn't have a party. There should be no political movement if you want to see yourself slightly different, but actually you're a Turk. If you're not a Turk, leave. And that has been a big issue. And Armenians. And I think, yeah, I think I have a, a couple of slides when I get to the neighbors. This is just, you can see that online, you can see uh, how the Grand National Assembly, it's also called the Parliament, uh, is, uh, shows, you know, this is the AKP and this is uh, uh, the uh, CHP. But in terms of numbers, the AKP and their alliance have the majority. There are elections coming up this end of March. So there's been a lot of 
you know, rhetoric around uh, different issues. Erdogan is kind of gearing up to get people to vote for his party. By, in, I say, incenting fear by, by also looking at issues, you know, making issues, blowing up issues that shouldn't be issues. When you see a Turkish news right now, he's in Kahoot, he wants to show he's a strong man. America, we don't need America, we can use Russia. When it comes to the fighters, I have a slide here, F-53, the, the, what are they called? Patriot? Some of you know that better. Patriot missiles, and then the Russians are selling. Actually, Turkey is buying also missiles from Russia. Trump immediately stopped uh, the sale to Turkey. So they've been in kind of a war between each other, verbally, of who is right here. Oh, here you can see that's a picture of you know sermons, and that that's a title from an um, uh, an article that I read: sermons and shouted insults. How Erdogan keeps Turkey spellbound. So sometimes twice a day, weekends three times a day, he gives these big speeches. Reminds me a little bit of Venezuela. Hugo Chavez, before he died of cancer a few years back, he was somebody. He is Sunday every Sunday he gave these hour long for hours and hours and hours. He spoke to his people, whoever wanted to listen to it and well don't want to go into Venezuela that's a mess these days uh, I, I just put that map up just to show you what's happening in Turkey how divided Turkey is uh, with uh, uh, the no votes against the referendum which is basically also against the AKP and that their rise to too much power people seeing that they are having too much power compared to the uh, uh, the yes votes, which is Anatolia, which is more the rural area. You have here the westernized secular elite, often with populists. You hear about the educated elite, they're the enemy, which I think wouldn't you want your people to be educated? Education is often downplayed, unfortunately. Um, contemporary issue, when you look at uh, uh, nowadays, at different articles, you can see right away Gülen, that's somebody I need to mention, that is uh, the arch enemy of Erdogan. But Gülen is uh, a cleric, Fethullah Gülen, who is actually resides in Pennsylvania. And uh, Erdogan wants him uh, sent to Turkey, but you know, so there's another issue that he has with with the uh, Trump administration, actually was already with Obama, because uh, the AKP and Erdogan claim that the coup in 2016 uh, was created by the Gülen organization, which is, um, which they were very good friends. Gülen helped him come to power and take power away from the military in 2000 up until about 2013, and then they had a fallout. Gülen is a much more moderate Islamist, but he's an, you know, an Islam uh, preacher, but he sees the individual. He puts emphasis on the individual, and politically he thinks the country should stay secular, while Erdogan is more of a pragmatist. He wants to have an Islamic uh, state. Here he rattles against the NATO giving arms, and this is, and you have to know, gives arms to terrorists. He's talking about the Syrian Kurds, because the big fear, and that's also the issue with the US, is that um, with the, Kur the Syrian Kurds getting arms from the United States, we have been supporting the Syrian Kurds because they are fighting ISIS, but the Syrian Kurds, of course, are friends of the Turkish Kurds, and then Erdogan fears that the Kurdish Tur uh, uh, Kurds will start up their talk about an autonomous region again. And you have the same issue with here. Syrian Kurdish leader, border force needs, uh, pr uh, needs more protection. The Kurds, just quick here, you see the region here of the Kurds. The majority of the Kurds of these, and you also see 25 and 35 million, there is not a clear number how many Kurds there are. It's quite a margin, 10 million. Uh, but they're straddling the borders of Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Armenia, and the majority lives in Turkey which is a fear and they uh, of Erdogan that they want to create uh, Kurdistan, which happened in northern Iraq, has a semi-autonomous uh, region, the Iraqi Kurdans, uh, Kurds. Here you can see that too, a little bit better. I just want to throw a few pictures in of 
you know, people, everyday people. This is in Anatolia. Uh, these are older women, young women don't wear this kind of clothing anymore. Uh, but these are, you know, people whose lives are part of what uh, uh, were changed under Ataturk, the parents probably, she's an older woman. And uh, you can see wearing a headscarf, wearing a headscarf, a loose scarf, nothing traumatic. That is more a traditional scarf. That's why I threw that picture in compared to the very, if you go to Iran, uh, very severe uh, type of scarf that you see in some other Muslim countries. Um, we kind of, yeah, uh, yeah here, here also too, she's wearing a traditional scarf. This is a kind of scarf with the back. They actually have a, a something in there so they make it look nicer. That's a very, for me, that's, that's what I see in Turkey more than I've been in Senegal, different type of scarf. So the, that's another, you could talk, you know, I could talk hours about the issue around women and Muslims and scarves. Um, Trump and Erdogan, allies or adversaries, so there's a, quite a bit of, of back and forth uh, right now of also insults, tweets or insult in talks by Erdogan, by tweets by Trump. Unfortunately, I sometimes think, you know, I, I w wish they would be a bit more civil the way they talk about each other and other leaders. That's that article with NATO gives arms. This is very current, the US Patriot, miss Patriot missile and the S-400. Turkey is going to buy the S-400 and uh, the US at the moment step back and say then you won't get our, uh, you know, the US Patriot. So there, there are a lot of details about that you can see online, you know, what's going on. But in some ways I would say Erdogan is showing his you know, stance is I can, I can, I don't need the United States, I don't need the EU um, neighbors, because when you see here with the EU, of course, Greece, Cyprus is a problem. Um, let me see, so the EU refugee agreement you've heard about, that's about two years old. Uh, many people say it didn't really work. It's not, it's against human rights, it's against the Geneva Convention to force people, if they make it, uh, Syrian refugees to Greece, the agreement is that they're sent back to Turkey if they come in illegal. Turkey has kept a few million refugees in return they have received, or they're supposed to receive, three, four billion uh, euros. They haven't received all of that money yet, so they're starting to, there's rumbling around that. And they're supposed to have free visa travel in the, in the EU region for Turkish citizens, which hasn't happened either. So there's, this is an upcoming problem. You will hear more about uh, how to solve that. Opponents of this here, you can see the EU grubby and dangerous deal with Turkey say, well, giving Turkey the money and then how, you know, the EU has no control of how are these refugees treated in Turkey? Do they get help? Do they have housing? Uh, are they being sent back by Turks to Syria or wherever they came from? Uh, it's more like, so opponents say, you're just moving them away because you, like Merkel in Germany, were under so much pressure to lose political power because so many people listen to the side that tells them this is dangerous, to you know, people, Muslims don't belong in this country, Hungary is a country, and you're going to hear more about that next week. Um, so openly saying Hungary is a Christian country, there's no place for Muslims. That old chism between, uh, chism between Muslims and Christians comes up. Uh, here you see uh, Greece and Turkey are trying, they're always some good sides and then they have a fallout again. But it's a difficult relationship Turkey has with Greece due to the past and due to Cyprus. Cyprus is a problem. And just yesterday or this morning I saw news that ExxonMobil found um, gas. Uh, um, in, I, I, don't, I didn't see where, around, somewhere around Cyprus. So there's a huge field of gas. That's a lot of money, a lot of potential. Who is going to get, you know, get that gas? The Greeks want uh, act, actually Exxon My, uh, Mobil to uh, drill. The Turks want their own. They want to have the, a different company drill. So you're starting to have problems here again. Cyprus, 
just in case you don't uh, know, in the 1974, Turkey moved in to help the uh, Turkish Cypriots, which were only about 18, 20% of Cyprus were Turkish, the others were Greek Cypriots. The reason is Greece was a dictatorship at that time and the junta decided to move in and and take over all of Cyprus. Cyprus was a British uh, protectorate and then semi-independent. So in some ways when you hear that you're all oh, okay the Turks came to help their uh, Turkish uh, Cyprus but it was also a power play between Turkey and Greece over this island that has not been solved. One of the oddities is this part of Cyprus is EU and this part, the Turkish part, is not. The Turkish part is seen as a rogue state because it only is acknowledged as a state, independent state, Northern Republic, by one country, by Turkey. So, um, Georgia, good relationships due to also the pipeline, gas pipeline, uh, and Georgia is very interested in good relationships with Turkey and with the West because they have a fearful relationship, you know, a, a bad relationship with, a bad experiences with Russia, Russia moving in, taking over. Uh, <coughs> Armenia, not so good, actually. The border, you can see, this is an interesting website with uh, a border website I found, which is uh, live. You can actually click on, not this here, I just took a snapshot, but the border is closed. There were some good talks for a while in 2008, 7, 8, between Armenia and Turkey, and then uh, Armenia wants Turkey to acknowledge the genocide. Turkey refuses to do that. Uh, many countries in the world have acknowledged uh, that it was a genocide. 1915 to 17 and Turkey has apologized for the unfortunate death of many Armenians when the Armenians moved away from the Turkish Republic but they actually were forced to move so that's an issue it's complex um, I would say yeah it was a genocide but uh, that is an issue that Turkey does not want to address and also one reason to this whole area here is very rich in oil and gas and minerals. So uh, Azerbaijan has problems with Armenia. So there are a lot of small crises happen there because of uh, geopolitical reasons. Uh, this here is uh, actually a, like a, right here in 2007 and Turkish Armenian journalist was killed. So. Um, I just wanted to mention you know, that that is an ongoing problem in Turkey with nationalists, was a Turkish nationalist, because of course as a Turkish Armenian journalist he, runs, he ran his own newspaper uh, talking about the, the Armenian genocide, never using that word, that is forbidden, um, but that uh, created hatred. Uh, Syria. Actually, I wanted to, one of the problems in Syria that keeps coming up with Turkey is that the United States has uh, supported the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a U.S.-backed alliance of uh, Kurdish and Arab fighters, by this group, the uh, YPG, and Turks say the uh, YPG is in cahoots with the PKK, which is a terrorist organization. And the United, you know, our administration says, yeah, the PKK is, but the YPG is not. But it's complex that you can, you know, see here. Uh, this was just in the news. Uh, because of uh, Trump's very surprising announcement to pull out American troops of the Syrian conflict because there is no more conflict, there is no more uh, ISIS, uh, which most people don't agree with. They definitely have been to a very, they're, they're in a very small section only left. So uh, these three got together and said, what are we going to do? Because the, f the question is, what are we going to do with the region that the U.S. is controlling right now, the Syrian Kurds are controlling? And what's the interest of these three? Of course, um, uh, Putin, uh, Russia is the, the, the big, the only ally that Assad, Syrian uh, Bashar Assad has, so they're interested in the U.S. moving out. 
uh, Rouhani says the U.S. shouldn't be in this region. Wherever the U.S. shows up, there's a catastrophe. People don't want them there. Look at the Iraq war. And then Turkey sees it as a way to be in uh, agreement with these two to have uh, bilateral agreements in terms of economics too. And, uh, and, and they were also forced. They were forced to sit down and say, well, what are we going to do? Uh, and that hasn't been solved yet. We don't know yet. I wanted to look at yeah, Turkey. When you see Turkish news, um, right here, religious. So Turkey has been uh, talking about the uh, telling China to stop oppressing the Uyghurs, which is a Turkic tribe. And that tells you, and I pointed this, point this out here, that tells you a little bit about what's going on with Erdogan and the neo-Ottoman policies. That he's looking, he's been uh, known for talking about expanding the border. There have been in the news uh, a Turkey with different borders. That was a couple of years ago. Then it kind of dies down because, you know, you can't just talk about that. That raises eyebrows all over the world. How can you talk about an expanded Turkey? He talks about the Treaty of Lausanne wasn't fair. It was not the borders that Ataturk agreed to. He should have never agreed to that. Mosul is a problem. Mosul is very much a Turkic area. That should be part of Turkey. And then, of course, we are here to defend uh, Turkey, Turkic tribes' uh, rights, and that would be the one in China. Uh, the Gezi Park protests, I want to say a few things about that in 2013. These are pictures I took. I happened to be there right when it happened. It's a small park in Istanbul, in the middle of Istanbul. Istanbul is 17 million people, but in the more, the, the part where actually a lot of tourists go, close to Taksim Square. And Erdogan's party wanted to build uh, military barracks there in the uh, architecture of the Ottoman Empire. And about 50 people did a sit down and demonstrated because more of green park, there aren't many parks. Why do you take our park away? What Erdogan did, his party, he, he uh, sent the police with water cannons and tear gas to these 50 people. And what he underestimated is social media 2013 that he himself didn't know that much about yet at that time. With social media, with Facebook, the next day over a thousand people came because they heard about that. And that grew by the time I came three days later, there were tens of thousands of people during the day. It was. You know, people, they, they set up place to eat, and I have all these pictures here. You can see lots and lots of people. It was very peaceful. There was no, I mean, people had some chanting or so, but it was more of just gathering and showing in terms of numbers. We want this park to stay. And it turned, of course, away from Gezi Park. It turned into uh, criticism against this autocratic ruler. And I've got one, I think I'll show you. One little that I filmed that. <laughs> Sorry, I'll move away from that. Yeah. And did you turn this off? <laughs> Sorry about that. So Erdogan's way, the highway that tells you, uh, you know, the opposition of, you know, there are many Turks that are not happy with the way Turkish politics is moving right now. Uh, this is uh, Istikhal, is, it's a very busy street, it's always that busy. It was at that time, so there were tourists, there were visitors, and there were demonstrators. Um, you can see here the Fai Hawk uh, mask, so it was kind of a mix of people, it was very peaceful. It was actually kind of, and you find that a lot, you hear that about the Occupy movement, people helping each other, it's like one big community. People set up, I think, I, I won't show another one, uh, set up shop selling their, uh, their uh, simi, it's a sesame seed uh, uh, bun, kind of, or here selling because of tear gas, because tear gas came later, that came in the evening. A year later, I took 12 faculty with me to go around Turkey to different universities, and we happened to come at the anniversary of uh, the first Gezi Park Day, and we got caught in, in we couldn't get to Taksim, they cleared off Taksim, but we got uh, into a tear gas cloud. It's very unpleasant. 
Um, this is, and then I, at that time, I traveled to Izmir, to Ankara. Uh, this is Izmir. So people set up, and it's mostly young people, set up these tents. What happened for days on end, really, is at 9 o'clock at night, people opened. So all, it was more the older people who didn't really want to be there on the street, opened the windows and banked their pots for about a, you know, a couple of minutes. So to show their support of this movement. So at that time, there was a lot of hope that this will show the AKP not to go any further. It wasn't necessarily, this isn't a coup. We are not going to tear down the government. But we want you to know that you're going in the wrong direction. Unfortunately, as we know now, 2013, 2019, with the coup in 2016, a very odd uh, coup that happened uh, overnight with uh, as part of the military, not all of the military, occupying government buildings. There were shots at the hotel where Erdogan was, at the Marmara Sea. He wasn't at the time in the hotel anymore. He was flying. He used FaceTime to tell his people, I'm fine. and to call on his supporters, this is terrible, we need to tear, you know, we need to fight. So people actually, he told people, go on the street and fight these um, insurgents who are trying to overthrow the government. And they went out, they killed people, so, you know, he basically told people, go out there and fight. But it was also very confusing, who is, who is uh, behind that coup? Erdogan and the AKP immediately, like uh, a couple of hours after the coup, the next day said it's Gülen, which the critics say, how could you come up with this conclusion so fast? And the Gülen Foundation, the Gülen uh, group actually a few days earlier announced that they have a corruption uh, case against Erdogan, against uh, four sons of Erdogan's ministers. And uh, those ministers re had to resign, but the sons actually ended up not uh, being convicted. The case was thrown out because what happened from 2016 on is what some call a witch hunt, a perching, and it's still happening. Just a couple of days ago in the news, you saw uh, Erdogan again. Uh, take, I think I have a slide coming up. Uh, these are all this, yeah, here, a perching uh, of people. Uh, uh, arresting people, people lost their jobs, and we are talking thousands and thousands of people, and everybody knows the Gülen organization is very large, a lot of sympathizers, but that doesn't mean you have to, you know, like here, dismiss 150,000 civil workers, judges, and what, of course, that enabled uh, the AKP to replace the judges with their party sympathizers. And that's what's been happening since 2016, unfortunately. So Turkey is in a very precarious situation right now. When I look at Venezuela, another country where I've been that I, I have good friends with, so hopefully it's not going down the road there. But one thing, when you look at countries that have trouble, like Venezuela right now, Maduro is still in power because at least from the last, I heard I haven't, I've been concentrating on Turkey a couple of days ago, most of the military was still behind him. He needs the military. If he doesn't have the military, it's over because a lot of the world leaders have already spoken against Maduro. It's not comparable to Turkey at this point, but economy is a big po uh, point because Venezuela's economy has been shot for, you know, bad for years. Turkey is on a downwards uh, slide with a 40% devaluation of the lira, partly, and that's where the ranting and raving against Trump comes from because of the U.S.'s tariffs on steel that plunged the lira. Um, and in, in, uh, Erdogan basically is trying to hold on power by uh, uh, replacing um, the Gülen judges, if they were Gülen judges, or the opposition. Another big issue is shutting down the, the media. He's taken over most of the media, or the media is, uh, you know, uh, the press, they are too uh, timid to really speak up because it has been shown if you oppose him, and he's also just like many populists, uh, somebody who takes everything personal. So if you are uh, criticizing the government, you're criticizing Erdogan, and if you criticize Erdogan, he's going to send 
his people after you, and he has done that. Um, here's, that was just a couple days ago. Uh, let me see, I wanted to show you one. Freedom Mr. Erdogan lands in Berlin, journalists land in prison. The highest number of journalists in prison in the world is in Turkey. That tells you something, massive purge. These are just, what time, yeah, I need to. Uh, these are, uh, this here, that was very interesting. The one on the right side appeared in a newspaper about two years ago. The borders, at first you go, oh, okay, Turkey, but they were, wait a minute, what's, what is this here? This isn't Turkey. And here, there is a little bit of uh, parts that goes into Bulgaria and Greece, but particularly here around Mosul, Iraq, Syria, that's not Turkey. These are the Turkic tribes that the Grey Wolves have been saying they want to create a new uh, nation for, of Turkic people. Uh, and that's always dangerous when somebody starts talking about in their nationalist terms. Uh, I've already talked about the Uyghur Turks. So freedom in the world, rise of, you know, that's when I talk about Venezuela. There are many other countries, Hungary, Poland, we have that in Europe. We've got a rise of populist leaders that seems to be uh, appealing to a lot of people. Theory is it comes because of the huge gap in wealth, the wealth gap that we experience nowadays. Uh, inequality creates fear and then uh, in people, of course, and then leaders who come across as I am here for you, I'm against the establishment, whatever that is, and I'm not talking about the US, I'm talking about many countries where this has happened. And then when these uh, leaders get voted in, many have proven to then turn into authoritarian rulers, unfortunately, which is hopefully not here. But, um, you know, we have a president that also has tendencies to, uh, autocratic tendencies to, you know, talk about uh, um, a judge that he doesn't agree with, which a president shouldn't do. You should leave the legislative uh, and jurisdiction alone. <coughs> Uh, so freedom in the world is in decline uh, when you go on the website here. The Economist Intelligence Unit's democracy, I just found that a couple of days ago. Actually, we used that in class, and I was very surprised. I did not know that the U.S. has been uh, deemed a flawed democracy. Actually, most of the world is flawed democracy. There's not many full democracies. And then I looked at a flawed. What does that mean? You know, what? Well, one of the major reasons is the uh, the big split in the United States uh, the, the, between Democrats and Republicans, the fighting that goes on, uh, and and the um, yeah, that, that's that's the reason I found on that the Economist Intelligence website that it's really the people's um, feelings about the country. That's what they go after when they call it a flawed democracy. So the number is still pretty high with a seven. There are others that, you know, like uh, the lowest is North Korea numbered one point something. And then I just, I wanted to end with you know, I come from Germany, I come from a different background than Americans, a historical background. And when I see this, that is something he said during the Nuremberg trial, this is what I fear when I have uh, political, when I see political leaders who overstep their power. And, and that is what, you know, when, and it doesn't matter, Venezuela leftists, uh, you know, or well, North Korea, who knows what they are, they're just, you know, crazy. Uh, so leftist, rightist, Turkey is a very more turning towards the right. Uh, nevertheless, if you, you know, if you go after, you're just telling people, you're riling up their fears, you're telling them, uh, don't listen to the media they, who criticizes me, that's wrong, those are lies. Actually, the Nazis called that Lügen press, a lying press, they use that, just don't listen to them, listen to us, we've got the right way. And it's a patronizing way of dealing with the people. I'm not telling you what's going on in our meeting right now, I'll tell you when the time comes. That's what a father um, does to the child. I don't like that when political leaders do that to us. And then also, Unfortunately, I'm a woman, I look at that, and we have this trend to look at men again, and we need to have a leader, we need to have a male leader who protects us, 
Where does that come from? And that's something I want to leave with you to think about. I don't have a solution. I don't know. I mean, I want to be safe. I want somebody to lead the country I live in, to uh, provide for everybody, to uh, you know, try to have the wealth gap, uh, shorten the wealth, wealth gap, and so forth. Anyway, I think I'm over. Am I fine? Yeah? <laughs> Sorry, OK. <laughs> Because uh, let me see, I have one, one of my favorite. This is no demonstration. It's just uh, beautiful. Turn the sound down on your laptop. Do I? No, it's not connected. Shh. Can you turn it down? Yeah, because that was too loud. This is. Uh, I took that. I just love the sound of mosque and of the people. This is in Turkey, down at the Galata Bridge. No, it's. Wait, wait. What did I do now? Ah. Okay. Now I messed up. Oh, here. Where is the, here, and then I go here. Let's see if it works. A little louder. This is the Turkey I want you to remember. People walking, the, the bazaar from 16 something is here on the right side. Uh, this is the European side over there. Is the Lata Bridge. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So I think, and the, there you see um, you know, Istanbul, this is in Istanbul, and you see uh, multi-ethnic groups, you see, uh, and, and, and like I started my talk is you have, if you're a tourist there, everybody's going to help you, and they're very interested in you, even Americans, anti-Americanism is on the right, well, it's always been like that for years now, wherever you go, but you hear that, and you maybe come across it if you start talking politics, but generally in most countries, uh, and especially in Turkey, people are very, very friendly, and they want to try out their English, which is always <laughs> good, because Turkish is not easy, and most likely if you travel, you don't, you know, we just know a few words, like mehaba, which means hello. Well, thank you very much. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I should... Ah, yeah, I haven't mentioned the Jamal Khashoggi murder. How has uh, Jamal Khashoggi's murder affected the relationship between the U.S. and Turkey? Will Turkey start to pivot towards Russia? I, I would 